So welcome to the afternoon session for those of you that have been with us this morning. And welcome to the USA for those of you that have just woken up and are just coming to join us. We've had a fantastic morning so far. We started the morning reflecting on how the world has changed within the world of COVID-19, what that has meant for us personally, what that is meaning for the work that we do and the world that is around us and what it means for us here as catapulters that are coming together in this virtual format for the first time. So the good news is that um, we are still in this experiment that is the catapult cloud. We are still broadcasting to you and we've had some phenomenal conversations with speakers and amongst the community within the Hopin platform thus far. So I'm thrilled to be able to now move into the, the afternoon and to welcome some fresh new energy and a new, new folks, new voices that are just waking up and joining us from the States. And the first of those is going to be Liesl, Liesl Pritzker Simmons and Sam Bonzi, two impact investors that I've had the privilege of working with and knowing for quite some time. Liesl and I are on the tonic board together and uh, Sam is a sort of fellow ecosystem builder within the impact and also, you know, a, a wonderful impact investor himself. So Liesl and I were discussing how, she, when she was going to be able to come to the Catapult Future Fest and Sam too, neither of them had been able to visit us in Oslo. So with the birth of Catapult Cloud comes the birth of new opportunities and the privilege of welcoming you both here today. And it's going to be great to hear how your journey has gotten you this far, what you've seen, sort of how impact capital is being used as a lever for good and how the ecosystem is building but also what have you been reflecting over the last two or three months and, and what you want to share with our audience. So I am going to step out and leave you to it and I shall come back when you close out your conversation. Welcome. Thanks, Allison. Hi, Liesl. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi, everybody out there in the interwebs. Sorry, we can't all be with you in person, uh, but very much looking forward to the when that will be possible. Um, really excited about this conversation uh, with Liesl and excited about uh, our follow-up session coming soon, a chance to, to dive a bit deeper into the conversation that we'll have now. Um, so Liesl, as Allison touched on, you are a pioneering impact investor yourself. You've also been you know, a real leader in the work of building the field, both through the communities you've helped to start uh, or or lead as a board member, um, projects and initiatives you've funded as well. Uh, tell us a bit just to start about why you're an impact investor and why you've dedicated your life to this, really. Um, sure. Well, it's 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 great to be here. I wish we could all be in person, but um, this is the next best thing. Um, so. I mean, the the reason why I'm an impact investor, I mean, I mean, sort of technically operationally is because I got um, I was born into a really wealthy family um, and I inherited control over my assets when I was 21. And um, with that, I think comes a lot of responsibility. I cared a lot about what my investments were doing. Did I even really understand um, whether it was public markets or private markets? I, I basically inherited a pretty financial portfolio, not like an operating company or um, or anything like that. And so early on, I just simply wanted to know what my investments were doing. Um, and simply asking that question has sort of sent me on this whirlwind journey over really the last 15 years um, to then say, okay, not only do I really want to know what my investments are doing, I, I want to be proud of them. I want them to be doing really cool things, um, important things um, where investments can help to make the world a better place. And so um, over the years, what that means for our family office, which is um, Blue Haven, um, 
is that we invest in a range of different asset classes, a range of different sorts of sectors, um, but we always try to find opportunities and companies and funds where the business case um, is actually tied to the impact case. So the, the, the larger the strategy grows, whether it's you know, project finance for renewable energy projects or whether it's um, um, affordable housing here in the United States um, or whether it's um, you know, loans to small businesses that are run by veterans, people of color, or women um, in rural parts of America, that the, the, the business case and the impact case are closely linked together. Um, and so um, that has been really interesting. So we invest across different sorts of markets. Um, we also run our own um, uh, venture capital portfolio in-house where we invest directly into companies. Um, that portfolio is focused on fintech, logistics, and energy companies in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then we also, because we work really hard on, um, on the impact of our investment portfolio, we can then use our philanthropy or our concessionary investing um, in very sort of crisp and targeted ways. And to me, being an impact investor is not just about your market rate for profit portfolio, but really looking at how you're using all sorts of capital, um, financial, grant capital, social capital, intellectual capital um, to, to advance certain things. And so that's what we try to do. Um, but yeah, essentially, I, I was lucky enough to be born into a very, very privileged position. Um, and I think we all, anybody that has that, um, that privilege needs to take that very seriously. And so I want to, I want to, to use that capital as I steward it to the next generation in a way that um, serves the public good, not just our own family's wealth. That's not very exciting. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've found uh, so inspiring about, you know, your comprehensive capital deployment strategy over the years is that it's, it's just that, you know, you have a diversified, impact investment strategy that itself is um, nestled within uh, a broader strategy of deploying lots of different kinds of capital. But if you could just tell us a little bit more about the philosophical underpinnings of that and also how that strategy came together and what you've learned from it over the years. Sure. Um, one of the things that, um, that I've always found really compelling. I, I think it's interesting. Like I feel like in the sort of mid 2000s when I was, you know, just finished college and 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 was um, getting really excited about, you know, kind of microfinance and different sorts of fintech and mobile money and, and sort of and everything the the sort of hot trend in international development or philanthropy generally was everything should be a market-based solution. It's the only way. It's the only way something's going to scale. We uh, Nonprofits need to learn a lot from businesses and um, that's how you change the world. Or better yet, just go start a business. Um, even if it sort of looks like a nonprofit, um, go start. It's much better to be a for-profit social enterprise than a nonprofit. There was sort of this ethos around it. And, and I definitely was like, yeah, like gonna buy into that. Um, and in some cases, absolutely. I mean, I say I'm an impact investor, right? Like I think, I think markets can be great at scaling things. They can. I think, I mean, you look at the um sort of innovations in uh, in clean technology and renewable energy, I think energy is is a is a play, fintech. Um, markets are actually pretty good at coming up with innovative insurance products and things like that. They are. Um, however, markets are not good at everything. Um, they and they shouldn't be good at everything. And if if this COVID pandemic has taught us anything. Um, I think it's what the limitations of markets can be. And so I very much um, 
I think it's really important to recognize those limits. There's a wonderful um, philosopher uh, at Harvard named Michael Sandel, who writes a lot about this. Um, he has an excellent book called What Money Can't Buy um, that, that talks about um, this, that essentially we've morphed into um, a market society instead of a society that has markets. Um, and so, and that that's a distinction that we really need to address. And so we try to do, in terms of the work of our family office, um, we try to be cognizant of that. So our investment portfolio doesn't have a whole lot of education in it, for example, because I, I think there are a few wonderful use cases for for-profit businesses in education, but largely it's a policy play. I think I think that's that's where that needs to sit is over when we think about public policy, when we think about our elected officials. Um, those are where I want to put the resources that we um, that we think about um, when it comes to education. Um, healthcare, I think, is extremely complicated to be addressed only in private markets. I mean, I'm, I'm you know. I'm sitting here in the U.S. extremely jealous of all of you Norwegians and Scandinavians, as you all have have heard us opine about over the years, desperately jealous um, that that your governments understand this um, to. And of course, everything could be better. I know, but it's pretty dire over here. And so um, <laughs> um, I so basically. I guess also as an investor, it's important philosophically for us to understand where we cannot play and should not play. And so, um, or where our political voice is really the right type of capital to be used in that, in that situation. So um, we have, you know, within our family office, we sort of have a few different kind of departments. And my husband is in charge of our civics department, um, which is, uh, sets our sort of public policy strategy. We care a whole lot about um, uh, voting, um, particularly making sure that young people vote. That's a huge issue in our country. Um, arguably, I mean, honestly, you could argue that regardless of all of our climate change investments and across different asset classes, we've got about $80 million in climate change related investments. Um, that's great. I'm proud of what that's doing. I would argue that getting young people to vote is our most important climate change investment. Um, and so anyway, one of we what we try to do is, is yeah, think comprehensively, um, but also try not to boil the ocean. Um, so, uh, but yeah, try to recognize that our investment portfolio is an incredibly powerful tool, but not for everything. Right. I think this idea of matching capital to purpose and identifying the right tool to deploy within a given context to address a social and environmental issue is, is incredibly powerful and compelling. And we're living in the midst of a, a world historical um, pandemic that is ha has turned a lot of our assumptions about the role of the private sector, the role of the public sector, um, you know, business sustainability, nonprofit sustainability. A lot of these assumptions have been turned on their head. Um, how are you and uh, Ian and the rest of the Blue Haven team thinking about deploying capital uh, in the midst of this crisis? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we started doing, I think, what, what a lot of folks have done both for profit and nonprofit, which is just checking in with everybody, um, you know, trying to uh, sort of plug leaks where we can and triage where we can. Um, and depending on the investment and the industry and the geography that looks different in different places. Um, and, um, you know, trying to help and commiserate also with our CEOs and our founders and our, our executive directors, um, because uh, it's also just very, I mean, in addition to the business risk for everybody, it's, it's very stressful. It's all very stressful. Um, and so checking in sort of mental health wise um, as well, I think is really important. Um, but then, 
beyond that, and then we've been doing things like, you know, with our nonprofit um, grants, you know, converting project specific restricted grants to unrestricted, extending timelines, moving up disbursements, you know, trying to be as flexible as we can on that front. Um, and then also just deploying more cash as well. So we've invested in um, a fund run by Open Road Alliance um, and they do um, bridge loans to impact companies that are, um, they've been actually been doing this for a long time. Like when a company has sort of an event driven um, situation that they just need to bridge, um, they're very good at identifying uh, those sort of special circumstances and then they extend them alone. Um, and we've worked with them before. And so, I mean, you can't get more event driven than COVID. And so they, they raised a fund specifically related to this. So we invested in that. Um, they're, they're, they're wonderful and very good at what they do. It's tricky what they do. Um, and they actually were kind of purpose built for this. Um, thank God. Um, then the other thing, uh, the other large investment that we made. So we looked at a number of different kind of impact investing COVID related funds um, in different geographies and different areas. And, and there are a lot of things that I think are, are really, in, really exciting. Um, but we kept coming back to uh, sort of in conversations that I was having with my husband of maybe maybe just give people money. <laughs> maybe this is just exactly the right time for an unconditional cash transfer. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of research around injections of cash when you have an event-driven sort of crisis can be very helpful for families. So um, uh, we made a, a pretty big grant to give directly. Um, Cause again, they're purpose built for this. They're actually really good at this. Um, and so both they were able to target um, sort of needy families in, um, in hard hit zip codes in the U S um, they're very good at that and transferring money very efficiently. And then we also focused um, uh, actually the, the bulk of the grant um in and around Nairobi, where we have a lot of investments as well. Um, the money can go a little bit farther. Um, and so uh, that that was kind of our, our big COVID thing. We just kept coming back to, I think that might be the most effective use of, of our money um, in this particular circumstance. So yeah, we're, we're, we, we, we tried to find investment things and thought maybe we just give people the money. <laughs> uh yeah, so that's been our our uh, our approach so far. I'm, I'm I think a lot about um, the reality of the context within which the impact investing market, as we know it, has uh, grown. You know, over the last fifteen years, and the term impact investing famously was coined in two thousand and seven, the same year uh, the global financial crisis hit and now the market has expanded within the context of the longest market expansion in history. Uh, I'm curious if, insofar as we allow ourselves to look past this present crisis, do you, do you have a point of view yet on how you think the context within which we're living now will shape or reshape the impact investing market and also if, what do we need to build after this? What comes next? Well, I think that's a that's a good question. Let me let me look into my crystal ball. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting, and you know, you're starting to get very mainstream, you know, financial reporting on, you know, ESG stocks are doing pretty well in this in this environment in this crisis. Um, and uh, so I think that's very helpful um, for this uh, uh, for this cause. The more that we can kind of point out that financial performance, you know, there's, I mean, our industry has grown tremendously, but we're still niche. You know, a lot of mainstream main mainstream um, sort of financial investors think impact investing is still that there are trade offs that you lose money that 
you know, it's all kind of touchy feely. And so I think the more evidence that we can get that, you know, we're not all, um, you know, sort of tree huggers, um, I think is, <laughs> is, is helpful. Um, and, and yet, again, I think, as, as people have said over and over and over again, and is blatantly clear with this pandemic is the stock market is not the real economy. And so getting those two things confused, which is not just an impact investing issue, um, is, is a problem. So I think as impact investors, um, getting closer to how our investments are working at the community level. And so I think that's become increasingly important. And a lot of impact investors have already said, you know, have have they tend to pull away from public markets for this reason of we want to know exactly what our money is doing on the ground. We want to see how it's affecting communities. We want to see that we're investing in small businesses and areas that really need it. And so um, I think this is something that everyone has known, but I at least I mean, kind of leaning more into that instead of what the public markets are doing, I think I think is. Um, is important, not getting blinded by, you know, we have how many millions of Americans that are unemployed right now and the stock market sort of, you couldn't tell, um, which just doesn't make any sense. And I don't really want to be a part of that story. Um, and so um, I think that's, that's a part of it. But I also think, um, again, leaning into uh, the policy piece here and leaning into our public sector as well is important as impact investors. Um, it, our investments don't make sense in, you know, a regulatory environment that favors big tech. Like our investments don't make sense um, when, you know, big pharmaceutical companies uh, can sort of set prices however they want and the government has to pay whatever they want. There's there's there are policy plays here that I think would make larger structural change that our individual investments can't make. And so I think I think using that side of the brain, um, I hope will become trendier in the mm -hmm. impact space. On that note, maybe a mindful we're coming up against our, our time limit here. In this moment of crisis, what do you find yourself most excited about? What's your uh, sort of candle flame of optimism burning in this moment? Uh, honestly, I think the um, the the people like it's it's mostly been um, that the the calls that we've been on, and particularly in this community, I feel like the sort of tribe of, of, of impact investors is, is um, can be very thoughtful. So what I've found most exciting is the real heart to hearts I've had with people that I deeply admire in the space and hearing what they're doing and, um, and that everybody's actually, okay. there's, there's, there's this sense of, of urgency that we're at a moment of change, but then also this sense that it's been nice to actually slow down just a little bit. Like, maybe that is part of the future that we can see is to just be a little less active, like just, I don't know. So I think it's that balance between a sense of urgency and a sense that, you know, if we could all just calm down a little bit, maybe we'd stop doing so much damage that then we have to urgently fix. <laughs> so um, I think, <laughs> that kind of conundrum. I think, I think there's, there's, I find optimism in that. Fantastic. I guess. Thanks. Well, we've got a lot of good stuff to dig into uh, in our session coming up at the top of the hour and hello again, Allison. Hopping back in. Well done. No sort of organizational um, stick needed for that conversation. And thank you for going sort of on the <laughs> journey with us and sort of sharing sort of openly Lisa on what it, you know, the ups and downs of sort of your journey. I can invite everybody to join you both in a session room um, at the top of the hour where they can sort of engage in questions with you in the chat and you know, hopefully some will be able to jump on the screen with you as well. But for now, thank you. We're in a blue shirt, have to come in uniform. Oh yeah, cool. 
<laughs> we didn't plan that in advance, but it looks good. Okay. Thanks ever so much. I will let you step out uh, so that we can move on to our next session. Cheers.